True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. One, we have two dogs rampaging out in the hall, up on the sixth floor, and I think they have their, you know, even their owner cannot control them. They are huge. Please hurry. I hear screaming, and I don't dare open the door. These dogs are ferocious. As I went around them, um, the dog, Hera, bit me, um, at which time I jumped away, turned around and said, hey, your dog just bit me. I immediately looked up and I see these two dogs coming at me, I mean, very quickly, snarling, put down my mail, I grabbed my cart, and just in time, put it in front of the dogs. The dog lunged, jumped on my dog, knocked it down, got its mouth over the back of my dog, and uh, looked to be basically digging its teeth into its back to break its back, I suspect. Hera and Bane were not the least bit aggressive. He loved... Uh, to lick people, he licked me all over, he licked Marjorie all over. Um, very approachable, just walk right up to him. Hera was the same way. She's a wonderful animal, she's loving, she's caring. Um, I nickname her a certified lick therapist because when you're not feeling well, she knows it. I believe that Hera was trying to protect me from Bane. <laughs> like whatever action she did, she was never involved in the attack on Miss Wimple. She was barking hysterically in the hallway. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. With her arms full of grocery bags, 33-year-old Diane Whipple had just returned to her upscale apartment in San Francisco on January 26, 2001. As she opened the door, a neighbor's dog, a 112-pound female Pressa Canario, named Hera, rushed down the hall and began barking at her, followed by 123-pound Bane who was on a leash but pulling his owner Marjorie Noel behind him. Diane was knocked to the floor and Bane attacked her. The mauling death of Diane Whipple was vicious and brutal. She suffered over 70 dog bites. The final bite tore open her neck, leading to fatal blood loss. A neighbor called 911 when she heard the horrible attack. Bane and Hera's owners would later deny any knowledge of their dog's propensity for violence. But nearly 30 people would come forward with stories of being lunged at or bit by one or both of the dogs. And then secrets emerged that painted an unfavorable picture of these owners. There's so much to talk about with this case. Responsible pet ownership, dog breeding, animal abuse, adoption laws, the definition of second-degree murder. This is just a crockpot full of fascinating topics. In Unleashed, a dog mauling in San Francisco... We will definitely ruffle some feathers, but hopefully the discussion will serve as an opportunity to take a closer look at our values and open the door for some fascinating listener feedback. To start us off, as usual, is Dick with a nice beer. I have a nice beer. I actually have a San Francisco beer. Perfect. How's that? So I'm going to review Anchor Steam Beer, which is brewed by Anchor Brewing Company in San Francisco. Now this is one of the uh, forerunners or I shouldn't say forerunner, but this is one of the earliest craft breweries in America. It was started by Fritz Maytag. So it's a California common, or what's known also as a steam beer. Now, this is a lager beer brewed with a special strain of yeast that works better at warmer temperatures. The yeast was trained to ferment quicker at these warmer temps. So they, they put them out in these shallow vessels, still hot, trying to cool it down quickly, but the yeast has to work fast at these higher temperatures. So Anchor Steam Beer is an amber color with a thick white head, pretty well carbonated, a lot of pretty bubbles floating in there. It has a yeasty, buttery, maybe some corn in there, which Mm. you might think doesn't sound so good, but it's not terrible. It's pretty nice. It's not terrible? That's not a rave review then? No, I mean, I don't really like this style of beer, so maybe that's what's coloring my view. Sure. And the the taste follows the nose quite well. It's a crisp and light beer, easy to drink. So let's go open a few. 
Okay. We can pop a few of these down easily. All right. Sounds great. Okay. Let's open it up. Here we are at the quiet end. Things are yeah. looking good here. We've got a couple seats, not too much going on. No, I think people are still enjoying this beautiful day. So we'll get started. So Diane Whipple grew up in the eastern United States. She was born in Princeton, New Jersey in 1968, and she lived in her maternal grandparents' house in Manhasset, New York, along with her mother, two uncles, and two aunts. That's an unusual upbringing. No dad. Her grandfather encouraged the kids to play sports, and Diane followed her uncles into lacrosse and eventually became an exceptional player in high school. She continued as a student athlete at Penn State University, where she was a three-time All-American and a key player in Penn State's national championships in lacrosse in 1987 and 1989. And in her senior year, the university honored her as its best woman athlete. So these are pretty high accolades. Yeah, that's a big deal. It is. But in addition to her skill at lacrosse, she was a runner. She moved to California to train for the Olympics in the 800-meter dash. Well, Diane was living in San Diego in February of 1994, when a friend she had met through lacrosse invited her to dinner and dancing in L.A. Among the other guests was Sharon Smith, a college friend of the hostess, who was in town for training to become a manager at Charles Schwab. As soon as Diane met Sharon, she told their friend, she is going to be mine. So, wow. I guess she really struck her. There was instant attraction, I guess, huh? Yeah. Sharon moved to California a month later, and she and Diane settled together in San Francisco. On a vacation in St. Thomas, they decided to have a commitment ceremony, wrote their own vows, and exchanged rings, and they did hope to have children someday. But Diane and Sharon's hopes and plans for the future were brought to a sudden end when Diane was actually ripped apart by two violent dogs at her own doorstep. The two dogs that killed Diane were Presa Canarios, also known as Canary Dogs, named after the Canary Islands where the breed had been developed. They were originally used for dog fighting. These are very huge dogs, not only extremely strong, but very territorial. So this combination has in recent years caused them to be sought after by drug lords and gang leaders who were looking for imposing guard dogs. And they are very vicious dogs, or can be. They can be. And yeah. that's something we'll talk about, is what makes a dog vicious. Right. Yeah. Now, in fact, for a while, the Canary Islands banned them. Could not own a dog, uh, press a canario on the Canary Islands. Yes. I think that was rescinded after a while. But there was a time when they were just dog non grata or something. Well, I did a big search on YouTube of videos of these dogs, and most of the owners seem like they want to have a dog who's aggressive in some ways, want a guard dog. A lot of them are men who seem to enjoy and think it makes them kind of macho, it seems like, to have this kind of dog. So we'll talk about that. But I just think that maybe they aren't the best dogs to have as pets. They probably aren't. And and these these dogs, Bane and Hera, were not raised very well. No. I which, mean, how you raise them is important, Which for we'll sure. talk about, too. Every year, nearly 5 million dog attacks are reported in the U.S., but of these, only 15 to 20 are fatal. When Diane Whipple was mauled to death by a pair of dogs in her San Francisco apartment building, many people were left in shock and looking for answers. A media frenzy erupted and a criminal investigation began that would bring to the forefront an essential question. Just how responsible are people when their pets kill? In future discussions, it was apparent that much of the responsibility would be judged on the history of the dog and his or her owners. Well, absolutely. Sure. I think that you really have to look over how the dog was raised and how the owners had treated the dogs to really make a determination on who's responsible. Exactly. Now, it's important to note that Diane was afraid of these dogs, as were other residents in the building and other people in the Pacific Heights neighborhood. One of the dogs had bitten Diane on the wrist in December of 2000. Her injuries at that time were minor, partly because she had a heavy sports watch on, and that had taken the brunt of the bite. But following the fatal attack, about 40 people contacted the San Francisco Police Department 
to report previous incidents of aggression by the same dogs against themselves, their children, or their dogs. But none of them had reported these incidents to the police. I'm not sure why. It's been suggested that maybe they felt intimidated by the dog's owners, Robert Noel and Marjorie Noller, and they were a married couple who were attorneys in joint practice. So maybe they could be litigious. They could and were. Although I'm not sure the people knew that. But in any event, they did know that they were a couple of imposing people. Yeah, they didn't seem to care when their dogs attacked. No, they didn't. They seemed to kind of enjoy it, like I was saying about the guys I saw on YouTube, is they kind of enjoyed having these aggressive dogs. Right. And and Noel was a very large man, a very imposing man. So I can imagine how difficult it might be to try to make a complaint to him about the actions of his dogs. Right. But I mean, why can't you just go home and call somebody? He's going to know it was you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if animal control shows up and says, we got a complaint that your dog bit somebody's dog, he's going to know who they're talking about. Right. It was late afternoon in San Francisco when 37-year-old financial executive Sharon Smith was headed to her apartment that she shared with Diane for the past seven years. The two had planned a quiet evening at home. As Sharon neared the building in the wealthy neighborhood, she encountered a swarm of emergency vehicles. Sharon Smith pulled over after getting past the intersection, then she got out of the car and walked towards the building, and she would say later that she had a sick feeling in her stomach right from the beginning. Yeah, she had an inclination or a foreboding that something had happened to Diane. Yeah. Her thoughts turned immediately to Diane, and when she finally reached her building, her worst fears were confirmed. Diane had been attacked by her neighbor's dogs, and the attack left Diane mangled, bloody, and barely alive. She'd been rushed to San Francisco General Hospital. Sharon hurried to meet her at the hospital, and the prognosis was very grim. The surgeon met Sharon in the family room and explained to her that Diane had lost most of her blood, so she didn't have a pulse for 23 minutes, which meant that she was brain dead. Right. And she'd basically been torn apart by these dogs. Yes. And and had a huge gaping wound to her neck, so she bled out pretty quickly. So you can be without a pulse for a minute or two? Very few. Maybe maybe two or three. Yeah. But, but even with CPR, it doesn't help if your blood's gone. No. You right. have to have at least some blood volume. And, and if you're doing CPR, every time you do it, blood's popping out of your carotid or your jugular. It's not going to be very effective. It's not going to be effective at all. Right. No. Now, authorities at the scene were busy reconstructing the events of what appeared to be a horrendous accident. For police, this started about 4 p.m. with the 911 call. Yeah, an elderly neighbor called police from behind her apartment door because she didn't want to have anything to do with those animals. She was overhearing the vicious attack, and she said, we have two dogs rampaging out in the hall up on the sixth floor, and I think even their owner cannot control them. They are huge. Please hurry. I hear screaming and I don't dare open the door. The dogs are ferocious. Yeah, and I thought when I heard that, that maybe if you open your door and yelled at the dogs just to crack and yelled out, you could get them away from her. But it seems like they were just in this state of mind where they were in a rage. Yeah, they get in this state of mind where you really can't talk to them once they get going. And and if I'm a little old lady, I'm not (laughs) opening that door. Not, Not with what I'm listening to out in the hall. No, I I understand that. I just wondered if anyone could distract them. But it seems like they couldn't because, as we'll hear, the owner did say that she tried to stop it. And I believe that she, you know, may have. I think she tried to an extent. Yeah. But there wasn't any reasoning or any pulling the dogs off. They were in their zone. In the zone. That's one way of putting it. In the red zone. So the officers come there and they proceed very cautiously, of course. And when they advanced to the sixth floor hallway, they found something that was really shocking, even to people who'd been working for the police force for years and had seen some horrible things. So Lieutenant Henry Hunter of the San Francisco Police Department said, I got off the elevator there, and as soon as I stepped off, there's blood everywhere. At the end of the hallway, Diane Whipple lay naked and bleeding, her body covered with more than 70 bites. Everywhere, her legs, her arm, her head, neck area, 
Literally every stitch of clothing except for one was torn off, which I think was a sock. So remarkably, she was still conscious, although unable to talk. Now, could she have been conscious at that point? I mean, barely. Barely. I think she initially responded. I mean, she turned her head or something. Yeah. When they talked to her. That was about it. What and a horrific death. As you said, she well, she couldn't talk. Her larynx was destroyed. Yeah, that's just horrible. So police turned their attention to the dogs, and by then the dogs were secured in their owner's apartment. The first dog they took out of the building, that was Bane, the male, and he was still very violent and foaming at the mouth. They had to take him out with those big rods with the loop around the end because he was trying to bite them. Yeah, he was still feeling it. Yeah, he was still in that zone. Now, a short time later, they removed the second dog, the female. The only person who had witnessed the attack was one of the dog's owners, and that was Marjorie Noller. Noller was back in her apartment when police got there. She'd escaped this whole incident with only some minor injuries, but she did seem dazed and she was covered in Diane's blood. Once paramedics treated her, police on the scene began questioning her about the incident. So in an interview that they audio taped, Noller said her two dogs were gentle and well-trained, and this attack just came out of the blue as a complete surprise. Noller told police that around 4 p.m., she just returned from a walk with the dogs. As she opened her apartment door, Hera was loose and Bane was still on the leash. At that moment, Noller said her neighbor Diane Whipple came down the hallway carrying groceries, and she opened her own apartment door. But for some reason, Hera suddenly became interested, she said. The female dog began barking, which seemed to alert the male dog, and she was still holding the male dog Bane's leash, but she was not able to control him. He pulled away, and she was pulled off her feet and dragged with him toward Diane. So she said she desperately tried to restrain the 120-pound dog as he charged down the hallway. In seconds, the dog had closed in on Diane, who was just 5 foot 3, 110 pounds, and who was standing in front of her apartment door. And that's when he jumped on her. And then it was just all over. Nola recounted that Bane put his paws on either side of Diane's shoulders. So this gives you some idea how big these dogs are. He's up on his hind legs and his paws are at her shoulders. And their heads are just, they're bigger than a human head. And Nola said she shouted several times for the dogs to stop as she continued to yank at Bane's leash. But the animals are apparently out of control. They refuse to listen. And they knocked both Diane Whipple and Noller to the ground just outside Whipple's open apartment door. Then, according to Noller, the female dog, Hera, now joined in ripping at Diane's clothes. Noller said she then climbed on top of her neighbor to protect her, screaming at her to remain still. Bane made a final lunge as his teeth sliced through Diane's neck, spraying her blood on the walls and carpet. After the attack, Noller led the dogs back into her apartment. So, so how did she get the dogs away from her? I don't I, understand. I know. I guess they were just done? Maybe. I mean, this is her story. Yes. So we don't... But I, I don't feel like she wanted this to happen. No, I, I don't either. I think she might have had an idea that it could happen. Yeah. Right? But we'll discuss that. But yeah. I, I think that maybe there's some things left out of Noller's story. There could be. But anyway, they eventually did get back the the dogs into the apartment. Yeah, she did. She got them back. And I don't know how she did, because they said Bane was still in a fury. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't even want to be taken out. Yeah, scary. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, Diane's condition was critical, and at 8.55 p.m., she was pronounced dead. It only took a few days for a public outcry over the death to erupt, And before long, the tragic event would escalate into a criminal investigation against Noller and Noel. Yeah, well, a a lot of that, I think, is because they're just thoroughly despicable people. Yeah, they certainly didn't help their case, did they? No. No. But anyway, Noel and Noller were highly educated people. And they had been active in the uh, society life in San Francisco. But something had changed leading up to this incident. So let's see what they were up to around this time. Yeah, let's talk about that, because they were becoming strange. They were, and I can't find any one incident or anything that led to this. No, but they seemed like they were individually stable people, and then they got together and got really weird. Yeah. I mean, Noel was a rising lawyer. He was in a big deal law firm, 
in San Francisco. He was making a ton of money. And he had a family. He had a wife and kids. He had a family. He had a family back east that mm-hmm. he just abruptly left. Yes. Moved to California. Married a woman in California. Met Noller. Left and divorced that woman to be with Noller. Yeah, so they had some kind of effect on each other. There was some kind of strong attraction or... Something. But, I mean, here, here's a guy who is a successful attorney. And, and even when he actually did leave his firm and formed his own firm, with Noller, but they continued to be in high society. Yeah, for a while they did. For a while, until they started making remarks. They were at some party hosted by the Gettys, the very wealthy Gettys, and Noel was talking trash about them. So they soon became unwelcome. Okay. But that seemed to be okay with them. It seemed to become that way. Uh, Noel decided to start his own law firm with Noller after he lost his job in 1998. And he'd had a salary that was over 100000 a year, which is excellent money, especially back then. So he claimed that he was tired of working for a big firm. But that just seemed like a convenient comment because he wasn't wanted there. Yeah, he was fired. Yes. He didn't quit. No, he didn't. So the couple formed Noel and Noller. And most of their cases were small. And they were on the road quite a bit, taking cases wherever they could find them. Instead of representing the federal government and corporate heavyweights as he did before, Noel helped car crash victims to get settlements, and he filed employment rights suits against people that were fired. They also took on pro bono cases representing the homeless, the poor, and some nonprofit agencies. Noel did the court work and wrote the briefs. Noller, who didn't get licensed until 1992, nearly a decade after graduating law school, handled all the research and the editing. Yeah, I tried to find that out. Was it just that she couldn't pass the boards or what was going on? The or maybe bar? She, yeah, the bar. Yeah, I don't I'm, know. I'm doing medicine stuff. Yeah, but I don't know. couldn't pass the bar exam or just never took it? She was just a different person, and I think maybe she didn't even take it. Yeah, I yeah. guess. And I, I think if we're charitable, they're doing some good work for people that are underrepresented in society. It seems that way to start, yes. At least to begin with. Right. It seems like they had some kind of altruistic ideas to start off with. But of course, money was tight and they couldn't afford a real office. Their court papers gave 1 Samson Street, Suite 1900, as their office address. And receptionists and other attorneys at the Financial District office building don't remember them at all. The general manager confirmed that one of the rental options that you can get there is a virtual office. So they had no real office space, but they had the right to use this fancy downtown address on their letterhead. And occasionally they had access to a receptionist in the conference room. But for the most part, you'd call, you'd get an answering machine. One of the attorneys who was an opposing counsel in a case told interviewers that he used to be angry when he got voicemail instead of his secretary whenever he called Noel's office. And also one of the whistleblower guards was having problems with his boss, the Department of Corrections in California. He needed a lawyer to handle the employment suit. Now, Stoyer referred the guard to Noel because he heard that Noel liked representing cops. Well, they also represented convicted felons and filed lawsuits against the state of California on their behalf. And one of their clients was Paul Cornfed Schneider. This was a white supremacist and a member of the Aryan Brotherhood. It was Schneider who, while behind bars, conceived of and financed the project to acquire and breed these dogs, the Presa Canarios. So after Diane's death, Noel and Noller spoke to the press and appeared on television shows over and over. And this is when I feel like they really dug their own graves. This was not their best performance. Was it? <laughs> no, they did not come across well at all. Oh, God. People absolutely loathed them. And I can see why if you watch the footage. Yeah. On Good Morning America in February 2001, Noller, incredibly, I think, said, I wouldn't say it was an attack. Bain was just overly interested in Miss Whipple. And Noel also just suggested that Diane was wearing perfume that could have attracted Bain, or that she may have been taking steroids, which could influence the dog's behavior toward her. So here we are blaming the victim. Yeah, it's a big mistake, especially in a case where the victim here is so innocent. You're not asking to be attacked by a dog when you're walking in your own hallway. Noel also appeared on Primetime Live and insisted that Bane was a really gentle dog. 
These comments, combined with the couple's apparent lack of sadness or remorse, he saw no indication of that, really outraged the media and the public. Both dogs had been seized immediately after Diane's death, and Bain, who was the animal that inflicted the fatal wounds, was euthanized the same day. Now Hera, the smaller, by a little bit, female, <laughs> was held by San Francisco Animal Care and Control pending the outcome of a dangerous dog hearing. Now, there's public outcry from both people who wanted the second dog destroyed immediately and from others who called for her to be spared. Now, some of these were well-meaning individuals who hoped to adopt and rehabilitate the dog, but there were others who threatened to bomb the shelter if the animal was put down. So really clear-thinking people. Well, that just puzzles me because there are dogs put to sleep every day who didn't kill anybody. So and, why is everyone so interested in this one dog? And nobody's advocating for them, are they? No. Except Jill. Yeah. There are people that do, but, you know, it's just a little hypocritical to me. In January 2002, after the dangerous dog hearing, Hera was euthanized, and the case was becoming a big news story. After evaluating the evidence collected by the San Francisco Police Department, investigators reviewed case law relating to different instances of fatal dog maulings. Murder convictions for such incidents had been obtained in Ohio and in Kansas, but there'd never been a charge of murder in a California case before. But still, in March 2001, grand jury proceedings were initiated to bring a charge of second-degree murder against Marjorie Noller, who was there during the attack, and an involuntary manslaughter charge against Noel. Who was not present. No. But he's got these dangerous dogs in an apartment. Right. So, an appropriate charge, it would seem. I believe so. I would say just having these dogs in an apartment was actually cruel to the animals as well. This isn't the life they are made for. No, like you said, these are big, huge dogs. They're supposed to be out patrolling the perimeter. That's what they've been bred for. And I think the apartment was like 800 square feet. It's a tiny little place, right? Well, I mean, it was a nice place, but too small for these two big dogs. Yes. Okay. But I mean, just the fact that they're breeding these dogs, and for what reason are they doing it, and are they appropriately taking care of the dogs? No. Now, just days after the district attorney asked the grand jury to make a precedent-setting finding, Sharon Smith took a significant step for equality for lesbian and gay couples. Supported by the National Center for Lesbian Rights and by private attorneys, she filed a civil suit for wrongful death against Noller and Noel as well as the owners and manager of the apartment building, to whom residents had complained about the aggressive dogs and the danger they created. So there had been complaints, just not to the right people. Apparently, yeah. At the time, no same-sex partner had sued for wrongful death in California, and there is no specific provision in the state law. Though the defendants entered a motion to strike the complaint, but in August of 2001, the Superior Court in California ruled that reading the wrongful death statute to exclude plaintiff would unduly punish her for her sexual orientation. So this is groundbreaking. It is. Such a reading has no place in our system of government, which has as one of its basic tenets equal protection for all. So that's excellent. And the civil suit proceeded, and it was settled. We're not sure of the amount, but I think it was significant. It was sealed by the court, but Sharon did announce that she would donate what she received to a foundation that she established in Diane's memory to provide scholarships for women lacrosse players. Now, in August 2001, the court granted the defendant's motion for a change of venue because, obviously, they were just hated in San Francisco. Right. I don't think they could have gotten an unbiased jury. Well, I think it's hard even in L.A. because this was national news. It was. So the trial began in Los Angeles in February 2002. And at that point, Noel and Noller were indigent. Noel was represented by a court-appointed attorney, and Marjorie's parents paid for her legal defense. After hiring and firing several lawyers, she was represented by Nedra Ruiz, who, during her opening statement, was really quite shocking the way she acted. She dropped to her hands and knees and crawled around the courtroom, kind of reenacting Noller's version of what had happened right. and how she tried to save Diane from Bain. She was pretty animated. Yeah, not in a good way. No, it wasn't. It was a, kind of a turnoff. It didn't come across well. No. Why do you think that is? That it didn't come across yeah, well? Yeah, what was it about it that was irritating? 
It was way over the top. I mean, I, I know you want to be passionate in your defense of your client, but this was too much. It just made her seem a little unstable. It, yeah, it did. Yeah. Prosecutors argued that during the time the dogs resided with the defendants, the dogs behaved in a manner that must have given Noel and Noller some knowledge to realize that Bane and Hera were dangerous and that they could kill a human. Prosecutors also argued that Noel and Noller callously disregarded the safety of others and that they didn't take any steps to reduce the grave danger that the dogs presented to people. So this was really the issue at the core of the entire case. Now, if I think about it, can you imagine having a child near one of these dogs at face level? No. No, it's just it, terrifying. That's an invitation for disaster. Yes. And there was one incident where Bane was on leash and a, a guy and his kid approached and the dog lunged at the child. But fortunately, Noel could yank him back. So if Noller had been holding the dog, could have gotten the kid right in the face. He might have, yeah. May have killed the child. All of this really brings us back to Noller and Noel's connection to that convict, Paul Schneider. Because this story. seems what really was at the heart of why they were doing this. Right. Yeah. So Robert Noel and Marjorie Noller met Schneider, Paul Cornfed Schneider, in 1997. This was during Noel's failed defense of a prison guard named Jose Garcia. To prison officials, Schneider was just a bad seed. He is in prison for life for aggravated assault and for the attempted murder of a guard. And as mentioned before, he was a member of the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang. Now, Noller and Noel claim that neither the gang nor Schneider was racist, and that gang membership is necessary to survive in the violent and segregated prison. It could be true, maybe. I've never been in prison, so I don't know. But when you see it on TV, it seems like you do need to get with a group to be safe. Okay, I'll grant that. So I'm but, not sure. But I think the definition of the Aryan Brotherhood is that they are racist. Absolutely, of course, yeah. And some of his behavior and letters and the fact that he wanted these dogs. Now, what he was going to do was set up a breeding operation and sell them as guard dogs. Noel and Noller said they adopted Schneider, which that's a strange thing to adopt a 30-something-year-old guy. Yeah. But they wanted to better protect him from prison authorities. And they, as his parents, they said they would have more legal power to make demands and decisions on his behalf than they did just as his attorneys. Now, I'm not sure if that's true. I mean, when you're an adult, your parents don't have any special rights to help you. No. I wouldn't think so. Well, there's more to that story. Well, and what's with this adoption law? Why are you allowed to adopt an adult? If there's a good reason for that, there might be. Somebody tell me of a case where this was something that was reasonable. Well, I guess it would be reasonable if you had a developmentally delayed adult. But Schneider certainly wasn't that. No, and he, he was, was a prisoner. He was actually a pretty intelligent guy. So that's pretty kooky. To them, though, they would say that he was smart, he was charming, and they also said he was honorable. He just refused to buckle under the system, Noller said about him. Now, Noel, in an interview, said that Schneider was a real hunk. Describing his new son at 226 pounds, 6 foot 2 or 6 foot 3, he said he's gorgeous and an absolute gentleman. Paul is the kind of person that if you put him in an Armani suit and take him home, your mother wouldn't let him out the door, Noel said. So Noel and Noller were smitten, for lack of a better word, with him. They certainly in were. In love with him, I guess. Well, yeah, let's talk about that part. Okay, let's do that. So Schneider and Noel crossed paths on some other cases, and a friendship evolved, and the inmate and his lawyers became pen pals. However, more than just letters were apparently exchanged. Nude photos of Noller were found in Schneider's cell during a search, and at some point, Schneider wrote to the couple about a desire to own dogs that he could watch grow up through photographs, sort of a way of living vicariously. Schneider and his cellmate Dale Breches in the lockdown unit chose the rare massive Presa Canario because of their mystique as fighting dogs. Well, the plan clearly went awry. Clearly. The prison accused the inmates of breeding fighting dogs to protect drug labs for the Mexican mafia, but the FBI found no wrongdoing. Then, the woman who was caring for the dogs became overwhelmed by them. So Hera came home with Noel and Noller in April 2000, and then they got Bane in September. 
the couple became really obsessed with these dogs. They spent $2,800 to get hip surgery for Bane, and they showed them off all over town on walks that would last hours and went for miles. They bought them toys, and Noel even got on all fours and barked to teach Hera how to play. And they took hundreds of photos to send to Snyder, which I believe a lot of these were used on the website to try and sell the dogs. they were. So other people weren't as comfortable with these dogs. Neighbors and passers-by kept their distance. Some told authorities that they feared the dogs and they'd had some run-ins with them. Noel nearly lost a finger, breaking up a fight between Bane and another dog. But still to this couple, it just seemed like the dogs could do no wrong. It's like parents of a misbehaving child that always defend the child. Officials at Pelican Bay State Prison, where Schneider was serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole, said the dogs were part of an illegal dogfighting ring run from the prison, or else bred to guard the methamphetamine labs run by the Mexican mafia. But Noller and Noel denied that, of course. But within days of Diane's death, Noller and Noel completed their legal adoption of Schneider, and then, while seeking evidence in the mauling, police found more pornographic photos of Noller in Schneider's cell. The two attorneys claimed that they had no idea that the dogs, one of them who was nicknamed Dog of Death by the neighbors, and that was Bane, posed a threat to others. Bane, whose name actually means cause of death and destruction, and Hera, named after the cruel Greek goddess who bore the god of war, had actually killed livestock and domestic pets while they were with their first caretaker, the one who was supposed to be breeding them. Right. This is one of those kind of prison groupie people. Yeah. You yeah. Know? I, I don't... She was kind of a Schneider groupie anyway. Mean to knock her. It would be derogatory towards her, but she raised these dogs. She tried to. The caretaker said she gave up the dogs to the two lawyers, Noel and Noller, because the dogs scared her. Now, Schneider had bought the dogs using settlement money from a medical malpractice lawsuit that he had filed against the prison system and is communicating with this woman outside of the prison and convinced her to breed the dogs. Now, she had no control of them, and they ran in a pack on her farm, eventually killing and eating her livestock, sheep and chickens. Yeah, so this caretaker, Janet, told investigators how Paul told her that the dogs would protect her sheep. He told her that the Presa Canario was just like a Rottweiler, and they were championship dogs, and they would help her and keep her company and ride around with her in her car. But these dogs are notorious for territorial and a very determined personality. They're fearless, and they can be very aggressive. They were impetuous, and what impressed American breeders was the fact that the Presa could remain docile, but then could suddenly move with great speed in action, which to me makes them scarier. Yeah. I mean, you, you're not confronted with a vicious dog. You're looking at a, a dog that seems well-behaved. And many and, people... And on then, the, boom. Yes. And that's what I heard over and over again on YouTube videos and in the book that we read, is that these dogs can seem like sweethearts. And then just in a second, something affects them the wrong way. They have some idea. And they're ready to kill. So the, the Presa Canario is a result of crossbreeding of the pre-Hispanic molasoid dog with a dog native to the Canary Islands that had been bred for fighting. The cross mix created the Presa Canario, or Canary Dog, that was a powerful, muscular, well-proportioned, and robust animal. Yeah, these are big, big dogs. They are. When Janet received photos of Presa Canario pups, they are accompanied by website printouts from U.S. Pressa dog breeders, the Pressa Canario Club of America talked about the Pressa as a valued guard dog that could be counted on to protect the home and family. And the caretaker Janet was sent photos of young children riding around on Pressa's backs, along with tales about how friendly the dogs could be. She was never told that these dogs were considered dangerous, or that, among other things, owners were required to have insurance for them. But from the photos of the pups, it was impossible for Janet to see how powerful the dogs were, how severe and frightening they could be. She had read internet excerpts that described the Pressa as affectionate, docile, and well-behaved with its owner and family. She understood the Pressa Canario was going to be a loyal dog, and that it was a rare breed that could be trusted to be by her side and be protective. Now, the fact that this dog would not hesitate to attack anyone that it saw as a threat and that the attack could be deadly 
wasn't really known to her. So she gave Paul the go-ahead, and he called with a list of three press of breeders for Janet to contact. These were Red Star, Dark Force, and Hard Times Kennels. Now these names of the breeders, to me, give a clue. I guess Red Star, sure. But Dark Force Kennels and Hard Times Hard Kennels? Times? Yeah. That doesn't sound like you're getting a family member. No, it doesn't, does it? It does sound like you want a guard mm-hmm. dog, and only a guard dog. So Bane was already 30 pounds when Janet first got him, and she remembered seeing these huge paws and thinking he's really going to be big, but she never imagined how big he would get. Eventually his head was as big as a steering wheel. Bane seemed to understand no, and he would sit, but he was clumsy, and as much as she tried to keep him under control, he wasn't graceful, and he sometimes got led astray. Now she also got a female named Isis, and Isis was a light tan dog. Bane was a black one. So they were beautiful dogs, and both were good at responding at first to her commands and her praise. And they seemed adaptable, and she thought things were going to be okay. But then she started seeing some trouble, right? That she did. So she said when we first got him, Bane was not even here for a week when he bumped his head. We didn't know what happened to him. He was fine when he went to bed that night out in his little yard that we had built for him. But when I got up in the morning, he's got this big lump on his head. So she drove Bane 20 miles to the vet, and when he shaved Bane's head a bit, he discovered a huge knot, and he was concerned that Bane might have some brain damage. Yeah, so we don't know if that's part of the problem? Well, if it was just him that was the vicious dog, maybe, but we're looking at a lot of presses that are vicious. So, But anyway, Bane and Isis played well together, even though they were very different. And whatever their differences, whatever their flaws, Bane and Isis were Janet's babies. She had driven eight hours through the mountains to get them, and she fell in love with the pups at first sight. So at first it seemed like a great thing. They were fun to cuddle, soft to touch, and very friendly. But as it turned out, they had very strong personalities that came to the forefront. It didn't take long for Bane and Isis to just take over her farm. They became the keepers of all the animals on that land, and they protected everyone, even the cats. And all along, Paul was keeping track of these dogs, writing to Janet often with questions and instructions about their growth, their weight, how to handle them. And Paul wanted Janet to remember that he'd paid a lot of money for these animals. They'd cost a couple thousand dollars apiece, and he planned to keep tabs on her. He said he couldn't trust Janet to raise champions on her own, and he wanted to be sure the dogs were raised right. So he insisted that she feed them special growth food and dietary supplements. Now, I'm not sure if any of these things were things that would encourage aggression, but I wouldn't be surprised. Well, yeah, I I think that the aggressiveness turned out to be because they weren't raised properly by Janet. Well, yes, but there seems to be a nature about these dogs. They didn't get to socialize. I'm not sure she socialized with them that much. I know she loved them and stuff, but it sounds like particularly when they were bigger dogs that they spent time, most of their time, chained up outside. Well, yeah. I don't think she knew what to do with them. So how's that going to work with the dogs? I don't know. I mean, it started out bad, right? Because when Janet was supposed to go get the dogs, her car wouldn't start. So Paul had had Brenda Story, the mother of his inmate, go to get the pups from the Sacramento airport and sign for them. And then it was a few days before Janet could make it down to that house to get the dogs. And when Janet finally borrowed a truck and got to the Story's place, Brenda Story blamed Janet for being unreliable. And she blamed Janet for having been put upon by Paul who was giving orders out from the prison. And I don't understand how he controlled them when he's in prison. Yeah, well, he's got letters he gets out. But Brenda didn't want to have anything to do with these dogs. She was just going along with it because her son was in prison with Paul, and she knew that Paul Schneider was a threat to her son. So she didn't like the whole idea of Schneider being in the dog business, but she didn't say anything. But she hadn't bargained for all these problems of having these dogs in her house. Yeah, so Schneider eventually sent a money order to help pay for Story's time in trouble. But the money didn't arrive for weeks. Yeah, so she had to pay for their food and their supplements and all that, and it was just too much. Plus, she said they were big and unruly in their house, so it seems like she had more trouble with them from the beginning than Janet would admit to. Absolutely. And it took Janet almost a week to get to Bain and Isis, and by that time, the Stories were at their wit's end. They practically shoved the dog crates into Janet's truck. 
and they were very happy to see the brood leave. So when Paul received her report, he wasn't happy with the way the dog pickup had gone. He felt that Janet had been irresponsible and couldn't be trusted anymore, and he didn't want her raising sissy dogs, he told her. Now, Bain was not to be friends with kittens on Janet's farm or anywhere else. He reminded Janet about Bain's pedigree. He needed his dogs to be aggressive. And if Janet couldn't handle it, he'd figure out another way. It didn't help matters that Janet was lagging on her promise to keep Paul up to the minute on the dogs. He didn't like the new sets of photos she was sending. He didn't think she was taking the enterprise seriously enough. And it made him particularly furious to think that his champion purebreds were not being tended to properly. So finally, it got to a time where Bane and Isis were supposed to breed. And Paul and Dale were worried that Janet was going to screw it up. So as Paul continued to hear new details about Isis, he was growing angrier at Janet. He wrote Janet a list of explicit instructions regarding how the dog should be fed. And he sent Janet a note explaining to her how important it was that the dogs grow, in his word, mighty. So if Janet did things correctly, he reminded her, Bane and Isis could stop any predator dead in its tracks. And Janet wouldn't have any more trouble with wild animals coming onto her farm. He said that the dogs would stop any mountain lion or coyote from coming. He also wanted her to feed the dogs half a pound of ground chicken or ground beef raw daily to make them tough, I guess. I mean, does that really do anything? No. I wouldn't think so. Possibly give you worms or something. <laughs> yeah. Right, but he wanted to make money off having puppies, of course. So Janet was balking at this whole thing because he wanted her to get two more females. But then she eventually agreed to that. So she was close to setting up the purchase of two Preston champions from a breeder in Ohio, and Paul Schneider put down a $900 deposit on these dogs. So Paul was basically forcing her into helping him purchase the next pair of dogs in her eyes. She didn't feel like she had much of a choice. She didn't. Because he was writing threatening notes to her. And at this point, maybe she was actually afraid of him. Well, why not? Yeah. You're dealing with a prisoner. So Janet didn't know why it was so important to Paul and Dale, his sailmate, to have these pictures. Because she didn't know that they were really serious in this business plan. And they already had a website that they called Doggo War, where they had pictures of the pups. And they advertised them as fighting dogs. So even with the pictures that she sent, the Doggo War website was pretty impressive. And they gave reports on how the dogs were growing. There were charts about their ancient bloodlines showing their famous ancestors, who had won numerous national and international dog shows, according to the website. They said that Bane was 150 pounds and growing, but that wasn't really true. And on the website, it said that Bane was one who causes death or destroys life and one who ruins or spoils. Janet totally lost control over her life at this point. She was frightened of Paul, and she found herself arguing with him constantly. And meanwhile, this dog, Bane, had just taken over her farm. Now, she took in these two new puppies, and Bane and Isis were jealous of them. The farm was Bane's territory. He'd already become the alpha. So he'd growl or bark at the two female pups, bullying them and picking on Hera in particular. So the smaller of the two, Hera, was really frightened of Bane. And Bane could sense that because he'd go over to her cage and lunge at her. He'd also raise his leg and urinate on her. Hera would go around slinking trying to avoid him, but he was actually kind of a sneaky dog. And Janet was totally at a loss for what to do. So now she had four of these dogs and she had to resort to chaining Bane and Isis on one side of the house and then chaining Hera and Fury, the other puppies, on the other side. But this didn't solve the problem because these dogs could break free of their chains. They actually would eat through fences, they would eat through wood, and Bane and Isis were really acting badly. They wouldn't be chained, they just wouldn't, there was no way to keep them chained, and they would find ways to break out and roam around the farm. So soon, Hera and Fury, the other two, had picked up this behavior, and Janet was very concerned about her sheep and her chickens. No matter how much reinforcement she put on their pens, no matter how much space she tried to give them, these four dogs would get loose. Then Isis became pregnant. So Janet's just thinking, holy shit. Yeah, she says, man, I'm in over my head now. Yeah, but she wasn't really that quick to give them up, which was no. counterproductive. But Bane was becoming more and more dog aggressive. Now, Paul would write to his associates on the outside, bragging about how Bane was bad to the bone. 
about how Bain was lording over the three females, about how he could beat on the pregnant Isis. Paul thought that Bain's pulling Isis out of her doghouse and pissing all over the inside of the doghouse was hilarious. For a canine, that's pretty aberrant behavior. But Paul found it amusing. Well, he's a violent man. He is. Schneider loved hearing reports that Bain was lunging at anything on four legs. Now, in the early spring, Isis gave birth, and according to Janet, she chose to deliver the pups out in the cold rather than in her doghouse. Isis disliked her offspring, Janet insisted. She would let some of them die, leaving them out in the cold. Isis had delivered ten puppies, but supposedly she'd killed some of them. There were bite marks on six of the ten pups. Now, when Janet got to Isis, she realized that six pups were unsalvageable. Isis had dug a hole for one pup, burying the newborn alive. Janet unburied the newborn, kept him breathing, and put the pup in warm water, and she managed to save his life. Isis didn't want anything to do with her puppies. Janet said she killed them, but they say that happens. I've seen rabbits do it, and it's not unusual. So Janet figured Isis just wasn't ready to be a mother. She tried to help her by taking the remaining pups into her home. Yeah, but Schneider didn't believe her. Well, you know... She had told him he had 10, ten. ten pups and six of them died. Yeah. So He's he... not going to believe that. He's thinking, oh, you're keeping them somewhere so you can sell them yourself. Yeah. I don't know how easy that would be. Well, but, I mean, I think you have to find the right owner. I think most people might be a little hesitant. Yeah, but as far as Schneider was concerned, Janet had taken the six missing pups, put them up for sale at 1000 to 2000 each, and was hiding the money. Yeah, so yeah. there was a falling out there. There was. Eddie wanted the dogs sent to live with Brenda's story, even though she really didn't want them. But they were getting worse. Isis killed Janet's cat, Chippy. Then about that same time, Marjorie Noller started calling her as Schneider's lawyer. Noller left nasty messages on her answering machine, threatening her, and claiming that her San Francisco law firm had proof that Brenda's story was the rightful owner of Doggo War Bane and Doggo War Isis. So Noller insisted that if she wasn't willing to turn the dogs over, a lien was going to be placed on the Hayfort property. So you really can't just say that. No. Now then, the first sheep was slaughtered, and Janet realized she'd have to drastically change things at the farm. She had to take back the upper hand. But it's really too late. I think it's way too late for that. But the dogs had ripped up all the cyclone fencing and had managed to get loose from their stakes. They are destroying her property, ripping up the ground chomping holes into the side of her house. These are powerful dogs, aren't they? Yeah. Then Hera and Fury started climbing over the fences. So Fury had jumped over the fence with a chain dragging, and a male sheep was dead. Bane was bouncing on the dead carcass of the ram. Janet wanted to believe that her dogs were just playing with the sheep. That's crazy thinking. That, that the ram just kind of died and keeled over. Come on. She wasn't there. She hadn't seen the kill. Still. And she didn't want to think Bane was capable of such a deed. Sure, but I mean, at some point you have to face reality. These dogs are scary. They are. And, and you know, what about the sheep? That's not fair to the sheep. Nope. It's terrible. Then she caught Bane with a rooster in his mouth, and she started facing facts that things were out of control. Yep, she finally realized what was going on. Yeah. So she hated what the dogs had done, but she still didn't want to give up on them. She was really attached to Bane, and even if she hadn't planned on having Hera and Fury, she thought she could salvage these dogs. But finally, she spoke to Christine Whitcomb, who was a county animal care and control officer, trying to get some um, reasonable feedback on what was going on. She'd been friends with her, but she didn't tell her the extent of the trouble. She kind of downplayed it. The ACC officer encouraged Janet to try and tame the dogs, offering a few basic suggestions that might help. But the calls and threats from Noel and Noller were continuing, and she finally decided to let the dogs go. She was tired of being badgered by the attorneys, and she finally realized that if they were so dangerous, it was probably good that they went to someone who could handle them. Although they don't end up going to someone who can handle them, really. But apparently the attorneys did have specific plans for these dogs. Marjorie claimed that Brenda had already arranged to sell Isis's four pups to a buyer in Southern California for $1,000 apiece, and Janet didn't think the puppies were old enough yet, but Marjorie Noller said that they were. 
And according to her charts and statistics and all the stuff she had online, the pups were eight weeks old and that was old enough. Now yeah. that seems a little young for any kind of puppy. I think that's around the age. I where thought it was more like 12. Could be weaned. Janet told Noller about how dangerous these dogs were. She recounted numerous incidents to her, but Noller still wanted to drive up from San Francisco and take possession of the dogs. So Noller and Noel hired a dog handler and distributed the dogs to people in California. They ended up with Bain and Hera. Right, but then their working relationship with Schneider evolved into this romantic adoption thing. So as years of visits and letter writing to Schneider went from the business to the whole pleasure aspect, Marjorie began having sexual fantasies about Paul, and in early letters Marjorie would hint at sex acts she wanted to perform on Paul. By the late 1990s, she was very blatant about it. Robert would perform sex acts on her, but she would fantasize that it was Paul, not Robert. Now Marjorie and Robert were getting more and more intimate with Paul. The erotic letters she wrote included images of herself and Robert having sex and saying that these are things that they wanted Paul to watch them do. Robert also wrote a few erotic suggestions to Paul, sending along full frontal photographs of Marjorie naked. And in one of her many confidential pieces of mail to Schneider, Marjorie started off with information about the lawsuit filed against Janet on behalf of Brenda Story. So that was the cover sheet, but then on page two, it was all about Marjorie having a three-way with Paul and Robert. Yeah, well, they could send stuff to Schneider that was attorney-client privilege, so they, they wouldn't be screened by prison authorities. Right, so if the first page looked okay. If they even looked. If they even looked at the first page, right. sure. Yeah. So she told Paul she planned to perform sex acts on herself and hoped that Robert would do the same so Paul could watch from the other side of the plexiglass wall when they visited. So allegedly this happened when they visited Paul in the attorney-client room. And this happened in mid-January, just days before Diane was killed. So whatever the truth about this is, the Pelican Bay sources said that Schneider's side of the attorney-client visiting room had to be washed down. Ew. Yeah, that's just... After a three-hour visit. I'm, I'm gagging on that one. That was really gross. Yeah. So by the time things had become sexual for the three of them, Noel and Noller had already driven down to L.A. and gotten Bain, who was being poorly treated by one of Paul's Mexican Mafia affiliates. So Bain was the kingpin of Paul's dog of war operation, and he wanted to be sure that Robert and Marjorie took special care of him, but he's already been exposed to a very violent lifestyle. And eventually, another really creepy thing is that sexual fantasies that the three shared began to include suggestions of sex acts with the dogs. Now, if this went beyond fantasy, we don't know. Paul treated it as if this was no big deal, and he allegedly received one photo that might have been proof. It was a picture of Marjorie naked, bending over, and one of the dogs was in the background behind her. Now, without seeing the photo, I can't say for sure if this was actual sexual thing. But it's pretty creepy. Well, she's naked. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you you walk around naked in front of your dogs all the time. It doesn't mean that you're having sex with your dogs. That's a different thing, right? I guess. But, but this but seemed pose, posed that way. Posing like that would yeah. suggest to me that there was something going on. That's very disturbing. Isn't it? Yes. So let's talk about a couple of the encounters that happened before the deadly attack. Yeah, there's a dog walker who remembered Hera as being strange because he'd been through a frightening encounter with her in 2000, June of 2000. Hera attacked Bogey, a large poodle that was walking in an off-leash area in Alta Plaza Park. On a beautiful summer afternoon, Ron Bozier struck up a conversation with Noel and Noller. Bozier was curious about their unusual dog. The dog walker had never heard of a Presa Canario before. He thought she was perhaps a cross between a Rottweiler and a pit bull. Now, as they continued to chat, Bogia and Noel decided the dogs should get to know each other, so they took Hera and Bogey off leash. So seconds later, when Bogey approached Hera and playfully put his paw on her, Hera immediately locked onto Bogey's neck, and she had latched onto the large poodle and was vigorously shaking him back and forth, tearing his skin. So that's an attack. Yeah, that's a serious attack. I mean, dogs fight, but that sounds like... She's going in for the kill. In the neck, yeah. Yeah. So Boja jumped in and got a headlock on Hera, keeping her from doing any more damage to the poodle. 
It's a brave thing to do. I don't know yeah. if I'd have the guts. Boy, isn't it tough? Yeah. So he used all his might, and he was finally able to get Hera to calm down a bit and to stop moving from side to side. As Boja let go of her head, he placed his thumbs behind Hera's jaws, knowing exactly where to apply pressure, intense pressure, to get her to release her grip. So fortunately, he had a lot of experience with dogs, I guess, as a dog walker. And it took him a full five minutes, but the dog walker kept adding pressure to the muscle at the back of Hera's jaw, and she finally released Bogey. Now, Boja couldn't help noticing that neither Noel nor Noller made any attempt to jump in or intercede. The two of them just seemed to be watching the incident as though they were watching live theater and were fascinated by the whole thing. So this is the thing that gets me. If that was your dog that did something like that, wouldn't you be, like, remorseful and apologetic and trying to help? Yes. And maybe you'd reconsider having that dog? Or at least letting it around people. But I'd be very careful about that dog. Yeah. Well, when the dogs were separated, there was an awful lot of blood. And Bozia realized that Hera had bitten deeply enough through the poodle's skin to cause some real issues. There was a flap of skin off and a seven-inch diagonal cut behind the dog's left ear. Bozia rushed the poodle over to a pet hospital where the dog had to get five sutures. Doesn't seem that many for an ear that's half bit off a seven-inch cut. Yeah, it doesn't. But so when the dog walker took Noel's card and had written down his home address, telling Noel that Bogey's owner might want compensation for the medical bills. Now, Noel offered his apology, but he did not offer to pay for any vet bills. But he did write Schneider about it, happy to tell Paul and Dale that their dog Hera had a truly intimidating presence. So that's what I'm talking about. They like get off on it, they're happy about that. They are. Jeez. So around that same time when Hera was still new to the neighborhood, David Moser, who lived in Noel and Noller's building, had an even more disturbing experience with the dog. Moser was in the process of moving out and had a box of clothing in his hands. When the elevator reached the lobby and he opened up the old-fashioned elevator door, he moved to get by Noel, Noller, and Hera, who were standing there, and they were taking up quite a bit of space at the elevator entrance. They seemed really pushy, like they wanted to get in the elevator before he could even get off of it. So he decided he'd try and go around them. But then as he was sliding by, the large box in his hands blocked his view, and suddenly Hera lunged and grabbed him by the pants, and her teeth went right through his jeans into his right buttock. So he yelled, your dog just bit me, and turned around to look to see if he was bleeding. And Noel just said, hmm, interesting. So Moser was pretty stunned by that. And he was watching as Noel walked to the elevator with his wife and his dog, closed the gate, and just left. Noel never reprimanded the dog or said another word about it. So for a few moments, Moser stayed in the lobby, quite shaken up. And it was hard for him to believe the owner's reactions, that they didn't even acknowledge that their dog had done anything. But then he went upstairs, showed his wife that he had a big welt, and it wasn't severe enough to get medical treatment, so he didn't do anything. Now, they were moving out of the building in a few days, and they felt it just wasn't worth it to complain. But they probably should have, don't you think? They probably should have. Because she was causing trouble all over Pacific Heights, and this was supposed to be the less aggressive of the two dogs. The nicer dog, right? I guess. Now, according to Noel and Noller, all incidents that evolved Hera were the other guy's fault. They claimed that their neighbor had charged Marjorie as he was coming out of the elevator, and that he hadn't been bitten, but he had, in fact, bumped himself on the elevator door. Yeah, these incidents and many more of them really didn't come to light until after Diane Whipple's death. Right. So in March of 2001, a grand jury indicted Noller and Noel. Noller was indicted for second-degree murder and involuntary manslaughter. Noel was indicted for involuntary manslaughter. And both also faced felony charges of keeping a mischievous dog. So at trial, Noller argued that she had attempted to defend Diane Whipple during the attack. But witnesses testified that Noller and Noel had repeatedly refused to control their dogs. A professional dog walker, from the story we told earlier, testified. And he said that he had told Noel that he needed to muzzle his dog when he brought him out. But he told the dog walker to just shut up and actually called the person names. So an acquaintance of Noel's testified that Noel did not apologize after Hera bit him, too, which was almost a year before this fatal attack. 
So ultimately, the jury found both Noel and Noller guilty of involuntary manslaughter and owning a mischievous animal that caused the death of a human being, and found Noller guilty of second-degree murder. Their convictions were based on the argument that they knew the dogs were aggressive towards other people, and they didn't take sufficient precautions. Now, whether they had actually trained the dogs to attack and fight remained unclear. Yeah, although the jury found Noller guilty of second-degree murder, at the sentencing part of the trial, the judge granted Noller a new trial on the second-degree murder conviction. He threw it out. Mm -hmm. The judge believed the appropriate standard for implied malice murder required that Noller knew taking the dog into the hall involved a high probability of death. So although the judge granted a new trial for the second-degree murder charge, he sentenced Noller to four years in prison for the lesser included involuntary manslaughter. And this was in July of 2002. Now, manslaughter and murder are exclusive. You can't be convicted of both for hmm. killing the same person. Okay. A new thing we learned. Yeah. The state appealed the judge's action and sought to reinstate the second-degree murder conviction. So, after Noller's and Noel's convictions in 2002, the State Bar of California suspended their law licenses, and Noel was disbarred in February 2007. In September 2003, Noel was released from prison. Now, as of 2004, both Noller and Noel had served terms for their manslaughter convictions, and Noller was out on bail while her second-degree murder conviction was under appeal. In May 2005, the state appellate court reversed the judge's grant of new second-degree murder trial for Noller. The appellate court ruled that implied malice murder did not require knowledge of a high probability of death, but rather just a conscious disregard of serious bodily injury. Yeah, so eventually in 2008, the court reinstated the second-degree murder conviction, and Noller was sentenced to 15 years to life. And she then appealed the court's actions. Again in 2010, yeah. But they declined to hear her appeal. Then is... Recently, as 2015, she petitioned the Court of Appeals to overturn her second-degree murder conviction, but they upheld it again in 2016. So as of this airing, she's in prison. Yes. For second-degree murder. Yeah. So what do you think about that? I mean, I always think of murder as being that you intend to kill someone. Me too. And manslaughter, you could be negligent, negligent homicide, something like that. Yeah. I think a lot of that is attorney or, or lawyer talk. I mean, I had no clue that they were mutually exclusive. You can't convict them of both. Well, it kind of makes sense, right? I guess. I mean, either you've murdered them or you've manslaughtered them. I don't know. Al although they did with Marjorie. She served time for manslaughter and then was put back in jail for second-degree murder. Right, but maybe they knocked that four years off her murder okay. sentence. I don't know. That's true. I'm not sure. It's very complicated, the whole thing. It is. But it just, it really surprised me, the second degree murder conviction. Yeah. Even I, though I don't like her, and I think she was extremely negligent and responsible. Yes. I just but can't I, see it as I, murder. I agree. I have a tough time thinking of it as murder. I mean, to, to me, that would it'd be something like a setting where she's got the dogs and she sees Whipple and she sicks them on her. Right, right. That'd be murder. Yes, I agree. But it sounded like she was trying to get them off of her. Yes, it just sounds like her. she was, you know, super so, negligent. Yeah. yeah, so manslaughter, yes. Yeah, so that surprises me, but a lot of the thing, I think, was just how unlikable she was and how everyone despised her and him. Yeah. Mostly because of their behavior with their response to her death was really terrible. It was oh, inadequate. It was, it was just so horrible. Yeah. I mean, that one interview, Noller said, why, she should have just shut the door, I would have. Yeah. Really? Like blaming her totally? I mean, they're, they're just so horrible when they talk that I can see where the, the sense of people is, that, oh, we, we ought to throw the book at these two. Yeah, if they had remorse and they were just stupid and, you know, messed yeah. up, then yeah. you would see but it. But they, they weren't remorseful at all. They, they weren't. certainly didn't appear to be remorseful. They certainly didn't. No, no. And what about these dogs? Can a breed actually be bad? Because we know that pit bulls have been labeled bad, and they're actually some lovely pit bulls. Yeah, well, I'm, I still think it's how you raise them. 
I think it is for the most part, but I certainly think there are dogs that are just have certain behavior problems, certain nature. Maybe not the entire breed, though. I'm not sure. Okay. So you're, you're thinking that they have fighting nature? I think maybe they can be bred that way. I mean, people breed dogs to do certain things, right? Yeah, so aggressiveness is a prized trait. Yeah, I think you can probably breed aggressive dogs. But then you also have to train them to be aggressive. Yes, I think so. So being... Although I think there can just be a bad dog here and there. Oh, sure. Yeah. Just like there can be a bad person here. Exactly. A lot like people, yeah. But anything that I read or heard or the videos I watched on these dogs, I mean, even the people that had them and seemed to really like them said that they want to dominate. And I think that's the problem, that these are dogs that want to be the alpha. And so they really don't necessarily respect the humans like a lot of breeds well, do. True. But I think if, if you start from the beginning and show the dog who's the boss, maybe that's not the way to put it. But a firm, controlling master might not make the dog so vicious. Yeah, but how many of us can really accomplish that? That's tough. Well, it is tough. An average but person can't raise a dog like that. The it's problem, tough. The problem with these dogs is that they have the reputation that they have. Yes. And so you get these assholes that train them purposely to be attack dogs. Well, I think that's what happened to pit bulls. Sure. Right. But, I mean, these dogs are so strong. Yeah. I mean, you got a 50-pound pit bull versus a 125-pound pressa. Right. Yeah. I'd take my chances with a pit bull. No, it's just a tough topic because I love dogs and I don't want to think that any dog is necessarily bad, but I don't know. I think that some breeds are probably tough to handle and yeah. have a... No, I, I agree. I, yeah. I think that there's dogs that have that nature mm -hmm. and with appropriate training, maybe they can get out of that. But for the most part, they're trained differently. So... They're tough dogs. I guess. I'm not sure exactly what to think about it, but I hope people will write in with their opinions on this and their experiences. Because as someone who's adopted older dogs that have been through some traumatic lives, it's hard once they learn certain habits. And then it's hard <laughs> to know how much you can deal with and when you just can't help the dog. I know. And it's hard to give up on a dog. But then you have to balance your responsibility to other people. Right? You might love a dog who's good with you and everything, but then if that dog's a threat to people, you have to be responsible too. So I just think it's a really tough thing to determine. It is. I don't know the answer to it. No, we no. don't. No, we don't. But I didn't think we would. <laughs> no, but I'm really hoping we can get some uh, experiences and opinions from our listeners on this one. I'm sure we can. Yeah. Okay, well, today's episode is sponsored by Grove Collaborative. Grove is an e-commerce company that makes it easy to discover the best natural products to take care of your home and your family. With their own safe, effective, and affordable Grove flagship products, as well as amazing brands like Method, 7th Generation, Tom's, and Real Simple, Grove delivers natural, beautiful, and sustainable products right to your door. So especially if you have children or pets in your home, I feel like Grove really makes you feel good that you're exposing them to only safe products and doing your best. You can sign up for Grove Collaborative at grove.co forward slash brewery, not grove.com, but grove.co, and you'll receive a $30 Mrs. Myers gift set for free with your order of just $20 or more. So with such a great offer, it's really worth giving it a try. There's no commitment there. Thanks, Grove. Before we move into feedback, Let's just take a minute to thank our listeners, our Tie Grabber members, our Patreon supporters, and everyone who's taken their time to send us feedback and suggestions. It's this community that embraces our podcast that makes it really fun for us. So we're happy when you listen and interact, but if you do see value in listening and you'd like an extra episode once in a while, you can support our podcast by joining Team Tie Grabber at tiegrabber.com or by going to Patreon and becoming a patron. As a member or a patron, you're going to get access to about 20 members-only TCB episodes and the new ones that we release every three to four weeks for members only. Plus, we'll send you a bottle opener or a snifter after you join, depending on if you're a $3 a month member or a $5 a month member. And I also am prone to throw in a few more pieces of swag for members, like stickers, magnets, or coasters. And there are some ways to offer support that don't cost anything, 
What you can do is follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. You can contribute to our True Crime Brewery fan discussion page on Facebook. And also, if you're able to take a few minutes out of your day and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to the podcast, we really appreciate that because that helps us out a lot. Okay, Dick, let's do some feedback. Okay. First one, Anna R. has some feedback and a case suggestion. So Anna says, I'm an avid listener of True Crime Podcasts, and True Crime Brewery is my favorite. Thank you, Anna. I love the approach you take. Thoroughly researched, lighthearted where appropriate, but never joking at a victim's expense. You and Dick bring a considered, informed point of view to all the cases you cover. Can you see me blushing? Yes. I know. I didn't mean to leave all that in, but it's nice stuff. I also really appreciate Dick's medical insights. Usually I avoid podcasts if I already know the case, but you two don't just go over the facts. You give analysis and a different perspective, which I find really interesting. So here's the case. I recently stumbled upon the case of the murder of Angelo Haddington. He was killed by his wife in self-defense because he was an abusive husband. When the ambulance came, it was discovered that he was in fact biologically female and had a prosthetic penis. Which, which was a surprise to his wife. <laughs> I, I just cannot comprehend any way in the universe that you're unaware that your husband has a prosthetic penis. Right. You know what this reminds me of? Remember that wedding that we went to where the bride said she didn't know afterwards that her husband had a, a contracted... <laughs> arm. Arm. Yeah, not a penis. No, but still... Yeah. She'd been living with him, sleeping with him, and she said that she didn't know about this deformity he had that he was born with. Right. Until afterwards. I know. So it just makes me think of that. You know, I can see with a penis you might some people might keep the lights off. I don't know. But I, it, it I is guess. it is kind of funny. But I, I would think there were there might not have ever been any oral sex involved, right? <laughs> then then that would be a giveaway. I would think it would be plasticky. <laughs> Right? Plastic tastes a certain way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Never mind. So obviously right. this is a case which we need to approach sensitively. Well, well we've already we, blown that. We just blew that one. <laughs> yeah. But I think it is interesting on lots of levels, and I'm confident that you and Dick would be able to do it well. Oh, now we've disappointed her because we've been stupid about it. Well, let's see. So Angelo Heddington and Elizabeth Rudofsky from Canada had a whirlwind romance which was followed by a shotgun wedding after four months of dating and then escalating domestic violence. Now, a shotgun wedding implies to me that the bride was pregnant. So how did she get pregnant? Oh, good point. Anyway. Maybe the shotgun wedding was just a hurried wedding. You're right. That doesn't make sense. But when a battered 27-year-old Elizabeth stabbed Angelo, age 30, after he attacked her in 2003, it was the paramedics who discovered the prosthetic penis under his clothes on the way to the hospital. Throughout their seven-month relationship, Angela had never been bare in the light with Elizabeth and always insisted on having sex in the dark, according to a police report. So Angelo, born Angela, had actually told his wife that a previous girlfriend had gotten angry and burned his genitals. Okay, so okay. she thought there was some kind of deformity or something going on. But still, interesting. It is. I'm going to have to look that one up. Okay. Because it, it just seems to be talking to us. Well, and you've got to find out why they called it a shotgun wedding. Because if she was pregnant, I'd really like to hear yeah. how she got pregnant. So I have a comment from David C. on an episode we did probably a year ago. We called it No Girls Allowed. And this was the story of Paula Sims, who actually killed her two baby daughters in separate incidents because they were girls, because her husband wanted boys. So David says, I'm new to your podcast, and I actually was led to it by Google. You both covered this case well with a couple of glaring omissions. Paula was in the hospital after delivering one of the girls, and her roommate from Jerseyville heard a phone conversation she had with Robert. Paula was apologizing for having a girl. I thought we mentioned that. I don't remember. Anyway. He said we omitted it. And the other omission was that Robert was able to ditch his surveillance. And that was on the afternoon that Heather was found, just across the bridge in Missouri. Heather was one of the babies. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. And, yeah, I definitely know that we didn't comment on that. So David says he was born and raised in Jersey County. I actually was friendly with Sheriff Yoakum, 
and know that he was frustrated not getting a murder charge and conviction. She was convicted of obstructing justice in Jersey County. The house in Alton is next to a school, and all these years later, it's just creepy to drive by that house. My wife and I were in a store a couple of years after the murders when Robert and Randy came in. Very bad vibes. Energy, question mark evil, was around him. So, David, you just got a feeling being next to them or near them. Yeah, but he knew. Yeah, he knew the story. He knew the story. But still, I mean, you you can have stories and, and not feel that vibe. Yeah, that's true. And these are the kind of feedback I really like. I mean, I like all feedback, but I like it when someone tells me something we missed or we didn't know, because I always know that we're missing things. Well, of course we are. Right. We can't have the perfect podcast. No, no. Or the day we do, we'll retire. (laughs) Yeah, I know. So it's really nice if people fill me in, and I really don't mind that at all. I have an Australian case and a suggestion of beer from Holly. All right. Holly says, I've enjoyed your podcast for over a year and always wait for new episodes. I'd like to suggest a crime that happened in my state and was well covered here in Australia. This is the murder of Alison Baden-Clay by her husband, Gerard Baden-Clay. Very interesting case, and I'm sure you'll find lots of info on it. I thought I'd also add a beer suggestion, considering you find it difficult to find good Australian beers. I'm not much of a beer drinker myself, but my father's favorite comes from James Squire Breweries and is called Hop Thief. I like that. It's a nice name. Really hope you look into both the beer suggestion and the case suggestion. All right. So have you heard of that beer? Not ever ever heard of that beer, so okay. I'll check it out. Check it out because this case seems really good. It's a case I definitely want to cover. Okay. So you want to give just a quick synopsis? So the synopsis are that things had started to unravel for Gerard Baden-Clay the night his wife Allison vanished. Behind the facade of happiness, their life together was riven with debt, infidelity, unfulfilled dreams, and bitter jealousy. We talk about those lives all the time, don't we? Yeah. And this is a synopsis from a book that's written on it. It began with a (laughs) phone call to police in Brisbane on October 20th, 2012. Gerard wanted to report his wife missing. When officers arrived to investigate, they found the real estate agent neatly dressed for work. Weeping welts on the side of his face were simply shaving cuts. (laughs) Okay. Well, that's what he told them, right? That's what he told them. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Right. It's tough to do that, though. Like you're filleting your face. Yeah, that's not from shaving. He must have been doing it with a straight razor. Now, police weren't so sure and they opened the book on one of Australia's biggest ever missing persons investigations in one of Brisbane's wealthiest suburbs. The Baden Clays had been married 14 years and had three young daughters. They were prominent figures in their community. Gerard was the great-grandson, wow, yeah, of scouting founder Robert Baden Powell and president of the local Chamber of Commerce and vice president of the school PNC, whatever that is. His wife, Allison, was a one-time beauty queen who spoke six languages and was a global human resources manager for a travel firm when she gave it all away to marry the man of her dreams. Now, ten days after Gerard reported her missing, Allison's body was discovered on a creek bank 14 kilometers from her home. This is a crime that captured the nation, twists, turns, secrets, and lies. That sounds good. Yeah, this was a well-covered case in Australia, and like I said, there's a book about it. Okay. So I definitely want to cover that one. Put it in the list. But you have to find the beer. I will find Hop the beer. Thief. Hop Thief. Yep. I'll check it out. All right. So I guess that wraps it up for today. See you guys next time. We'll meet you at the quiet end. At the quiet end. You're buying the beer. I am? They are. Oh. <laughs> All our friends. Okay. All okay. right. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye-bye. You.